So I wanted to make a few comments today around what we consider to be efficient electrification. And I'll touch on that term in just a moment. I do want to highlight EPRI's role in the industry really briefly, just to, to make sure that we ground the folks that aren't aware of us. We are the research and development organization, by and large, for the electricity sector. We're about a $450 million company. We cover the entire supply chain or value chain of the electricity sector from central generation, whether that be nuclear, coal, any sort of fossil generation, all the way down to the end use. And when we're going to talk today, we're talking about all three elements of, uh, of that particular uh, value chain. EPRI plays a really important role in the industry, and I like to start talks off with this just to make sure I ground everyone. Well, we are by and large funded by utilities. We are a not-for-profit, and EPRI's role in the industry has a public mission. We serve at the public, um, uh, public benefit, and our role is to make sure that we provide fact-based science to help inform, not influence the dialogue. So if you sense any excitement in my voice today about what I'm talking about, it's because I really like this opportunity that I see the industry having right now, and it doesn't mean that it's a EPRI advocacy of electrification or efficient electrification going forward. And the other comment I want to make really quickly is that we have a chance in our industry right now to move, and I probably shouldn't use football terms right now, but uh, I was told last night the one thing you can't mention tomorrow is anything about football. But I can tell you I have a son that went to Penn State, so Big Ten football also, and Penn State's suffering. If you look at what happens in the fourth quarter for Penn State, they've had four significant losses uh, in the fourth quarter where they have fallen apart by and large because they moved to a defensive strategy. Well, that's the, what I want to talk about today. Our industry has been defensive. If you're a part of the electric utility industry, we have been defensive for many, many years in terms of our obligation to serve, in terms of how we manage our load going forward. Reality is the utility industry has been flat in terms of growth. How do you sell less of your product and ultimately be successful, especially when affordability is one of the key drivers that your consumers are very focused on? So when we look at offensive versus defensive strategies, I hope today that I show you that the utility industry and the electricity sector in general, the energy sector, can, be, can begin to move forward in a much more offensive way. So let me just mention what we mean by efficient electrification. And it really is important that we take this at the very beginning and set the stage. We live in an industry like ours who has invested on an annual basis about $8 billion in energy efficiency. How do we reduce the amount of energy or reduce the amount of product that we sell? We invest about $8 billion a year. But we're focused on two things. How do I reduce a kilowatt hour of power or how do I reduce a therm of gas? Now, if you begin to think a little bit broader than that, energy is beyond kilowatt hours beyond a natural gas therm. Take a look at petroleum, how much energy cars use, and we're going to talk about all of this. But when we talk about efficient electrification, two things to keep in mind. We have an incredible opportunity based upon the current level of electrification as an end-use fuel, and we'll talk about some of these stats in just a minute. And then second, many end-use electrification technologies are much more efficient than their fossil fuel counterparts. That includes an internal combustion engine versus an electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is three to four, more time, three to four times more energy efficient than the equivalent internal combustion engine. Just keep that in mind. So think about energy efficiency in a broad context. We like to call it economy-wide energy efficiency. And get out of that narrow band that says, I'm in the utility or the electricity sector, and when I think about energy efficiency, I'm re reducing a kilowatt hour of power or I'm reducing a thermal gas. I'm going to argue that ultimately, we can have a win for society, a win for your consumers, and a win for the electricity sector in general by beginning to think about electrification of end use as being something that can benefit all three of those particular stakeholder groups. So moving forward, I just want to set the stage with a few things. We look at what we call the integrated energy network, and this is going to be a test for you at the end, but you can kind of think about uh, what each of these numbers up there uh, resembles, or excuse me, what each number reflects up there. Uh, but when we think about the integrated energy network, it's one thing to talk about the adoption of end-use electrification technologies, but in order to do that, that's highly dependent upon two things. One is that we've got to green the power supply, 
And we're going to talk about that, and we're doing a good job, just the opening comments in terms of the level of wind that's coming in Nebraska, significant. I think you have about 15% renewables right now, 15% of your, your load is renewables. Second thing is you're going to have an integrated grid, a much more dynamic and flexible grid. And then if you accomplish those first two things, then you can talk about the adoption, driving the adoption of end use electrification technologies. And I want to make one comment really quickly just about the grid. Folks love to say, and especially because I'm at a wind and solar conference. I hear this all the time in California. I just put solar panels up on my roof. Therefore, who needs the utility anymore? I'm ready to, to move on. I always tell those folks, keep in mind, the one thing that the grid enables you not only is reliability, resiliency when your sun's not shining, but it also is, enables the, the market for you. When you are generating more solar than you can use in California, it's the grid that takes that excess power, puts it back into the system, and is able to, uh, to effectively provide you a choice for what to do with the power that you're generating. So I'm always very cognizant that folks love to think that someday we're going to cut the wires and we're going to have solar and wind and, and not need the utilities at all. It's a very limited view in terms of, uh, of that particular perspective. The other thing I want to mention is each of these numbers, like I said, think about what they represent, and then I'll walk through and, and clarify for you. And uh, we can see from your perspective whether or not they resonate with you. And we're going to start with the first one. Whoops. First one is, what does 36% re represent in terms of cleaning the, the, the supply? Since 2008, the electricity sector in the United States has reduced its carbon footprint by 36%. We are now lower from a carbon footprint perspective than the transportation sector. So go into this economy-wide theme that I've started the, the conversation with. When we look at the electricity sector, we held the title of being the largest carbon footprint in the United States since about 1970, mid-1970s. 2008, that flipped. We have reduced our carbon because of what we are doing, and we'll talk about that in a minute, in terms of greening the power supply. And transportation, which is also having some benefits in terms of carbon reduction, now, though, is a higher carbon footprint than what the electricity sector is. Very important step, because ultimately, if you are greening the fuel, what I'm going to propose to you at the end is don't we want to use more of that fuel going forward? So taking a look at what we're doing on the greening of the power supply, you can see in Nebraska is very reflective of what's going on in the United States. There is a significant trend, by and large, driven by technology costs. Technology costs for solar, for wind, and now for battery storage have dropped significantly. Take a look at what you can now do from a community solar perspective in terms of the cost of community solar. You take a look at what the cost of wind generation is. And, and by the way, when you think of Nebraska, Nebraska, by and large, is the Saudi Arabia of wind. Now, I realize that that doesn't mean you want to build wind across the entire state, that there's many other considerations to be taken into, into uh, many other factors to be taken into consideration. But the reality is you have a resource here that is significant. That resource is really reasonable in terms of the cost of its uh, supply. And it's able to afford, ultimately, the greening of the power supply. Taking a look at some of these other aspects up there, XL Energy in Colorado went out for bid earlier this year in terms of uh, uh, wind, solar, and batteries, and the in storage, excuse me. The prices they got back were unbelievable in terms of the, uh, the value. We are now seeing the coupling of solar with storage, energy storage, battery storage by and large, the coupling of wind with battery storage, and we even have some of our utilities who are looking from a grid planning perspective of utilizing battery storage as a grid asset going forward. So it's no longer something that's out there that someday battery storage is going to come into the fold. How do we take advantage of it? It's here today. We can take advantage of it today. There's no breakthrough technologies that are required in terms of continuing to green the power supply. And in reality, we're starting to see the implementation of these particular uh, technologies in our everyday grids. Duke Energy just announced a $500 million request to install battery storage throughout their system. $500 million. That's significant in terms of our industry. And I'll tell you what's driving the overall cost of battery technology when you look at it. We're looking at battery technology that lasts for about four hours. 
industry is really focused on getting that up to six to 10 hours. You get up to six to 10 hours in that range and you're taking care of 98% of the reliability issues you would have associated with intermittency, 98%. So from a change in technology in the industry, from a greening, obviously renewables play a big role. I'm talking about that here today. Natural gas has played a significant role in terms of helping to reduce the overall carbon footprint. And very important, I talk a lot about electricity today, but reality natural gas is an incredibly important fuel to our energy future going forward. I do want to make a couple comments just in terms of uh, uh, taking a look at the technologies as they evolve going forward. Many times folks will say, hey, within the U.S., what's happening isn't really reflective of what's going on in the rest of the world. And that's really true. When you look at what's going on in China in terms of the adoption of wind and solar, it pales, or excuse me, it is on a scale of about five times of what's going on in the U.S. And then not only is it around wind, solar, but also battery storage. And China is really setting the bar in terms of these technologies and how they're going to continue to evolve. And I only bring that to your attention because sometimes we get very inward looking within the United States and say, is this technology really going to evolve as quickly as we think it is? It doesn't matter what's going on in the United States. It matters what's going on globally when you have an entity like China that's driving down these price points like they are. So significant change going on, but positive change in terms of greening the power supply. And the data point I want you to remember, 36%, is the amount that we have reduced the electricity sector carbon footprint since 2008. And once again, we are now lower than the transportation sector. So moving forward, let's talk about 88 gigawatts. That was the second number, 88 gigawatts. So what is 88 gigawatts? When you think about our grid, we have to think differently about the way that we manage intermittency going forward. So wind and solar, obviously the wind doesn't blow all the time, solar, the sun doesn't shine all the time. So as we begin to look forward and we think about the opportunity that we have here, how do we manage this intermittency? We love to think about battery storage as being one of those technologies that's going to be able to do that. Natural gas is a natural storage, physical fuel. In essence, you can think about it as a storage technology that helps to manage the intermittency. But there's another thing that we have at our, our fingertips that's a resource for us going forward. We have 30 million connected devices in the U.S. right now. Smart thermostats, water heaters, even some of your washers and dryers, et cetera. 30 million. That's just the tip of the iceberg for what a home will have going forward. So when you think about what 88 gigawatts represents, today we have about 200 gigawatts of what we'll call flexible load. In the next five years, we expect that to nearly go up by a third, 88 gigawatts to nearly 300. That'll be about 25% of the total capacity of all the generation in the U.S. We have 25% of that in flexible load that we can also use to help manage the grid going forward. So it's a real opportunity to think about how we do this differently. In the past, we used to think about demand response programs in a very limited fashion. Hey, I have a, a high peak load that I expect today, and therefore I'm going to see if some of my big industrial customers can't reduce their load down so I don't have to build generation capacity to, to manage that going forward. Well, think about that a little differently now. I have wind, and that wind only blows at certain hours of the day, or sun, the only, sun only shines at certain hours of the day. How do I begin to balance my load profile with my profile of supply, and how do I take advantage of this new flexible load that we really haven't utilized in the past because we didn't have a dynamic and flexible grid? By and large, you need communication on the grid in order to enable this, but if you are successful in doing that, you can dramatically change the load shape. Now, this is a really busy graph, so I'm only going to make three points for you, but they're really three very important points about what the future looks at. This looks at a load shape, typical in, in the uh, north central part of the United States, uh, 2015 compared to 2050. And I want to highlight three things for you. First of all, since the yellow stands out the most, look at the yellow on the left-hand side, 2015. That's the level of EV charging going on today. Okay? Take a look at what happens or what we're projecting in 2050. 
In 2050, we expect 60%, and this is across, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, we expect 60% of the vehicle miles traveled in the United States, and I know you're gonna say Nebraska's different, we'll talk about that in a minute. We expect 60% of vehicle miles traveled in the United States to be electric vehicles. That's gonna dramatically alter the load shape for a utility, and it's gonna present some opportunities for you as wind and solar developers. The reality is economics are built around how much I can use that wind and solar power, and if I now have a load that is willing to accept that at the right time of day, my resource becomes that much more valuable. That's the exciting part about this. We have an opportunity to increase the value of our wind and solar resources because we will have flexible loads that we can move around that mirror when that resource is generating power going forward. This is just one example of it, and I'm gonna tie this back into how you might wanna think from a strategy perspective. So you look at the, what's going on there. The second thing you'll see, vehicle charging, second thing you'll see though, is what happens to the load shape? All of a sudden you move from a summer peaking load shape to a winter peaking load shape. Two things driving that, energy efficiency, so we expect the continued significant improvements in energy efficiency, so heat pumps are gonna get even more efficient than they are today, which means in the summertime, when you need to cool your homes, the level of energy required is gonna go down. So energy efficiency is improving in the summertime, but now that heat pump, of course, is gonna be operating, it's gonna be a preferred technology going forward because of electrification of end uses, you're gonna see that winter peaking load continue to rise. And that's why when you see the, uh, the red and the space heat, all of a sudden it shoots up significantly. So now when you are thinking about system planning, and this is especially important for utilities as they think about system planning, but also for wind and solar developers, when is my power going to be needed? And am I going to be able to provide that winter peak in 2050 compared to the summer peak I'm currently providing today? So all of a sudden you have a different characteristic. And when I say that this is what we are projecting, let me just step back really quickly. We actually did, uh, EPRI's Board of Directors asked us to do a study called the U.S. National Electrification Assessment. Looked at the economic convergence of supply and then um, economic end use. And so we looked at what technologies are out there from a electrification perspective that would be economically viable for consumers. And we began to model our work together to look at how that impacts the supply mix going forward. So this, one of the key elements that you have to look at in doing that modeling is what happens to the load shape going forward. And we're gonna talk a lot more about the results of that, but if anyone's interested in that report, that was released back in April at the, uh, the press club in Washington, D.C. It's gotten a lot of play. We just finished an electrification 2018 conference in Long Beach, California. Had nearly 2,000 folks attend that conference. It is a lot of excitement in the industry around the opportunity that electrification holds, but that report is available publicly on EPRI's website if you want to see the full report. So we mentioned load profile, how important that's going to be. The other thing I want to mention to you is this whole concept of taking advantage of connected devices. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples that I think are relevant to this area because the co-op community, especially in public power, have done a great job in terms of establishing programs that take advantage of uh, of um, uh, uh, home devices and water heating, and we'll talk about the next Nest thermostat next. But you look at this particular profile right here, and that's a typical water heater. We have 50 million homes in the U.S., typical water heater load just all day long, kind of boiling water or simmering water on a stove. That's what a water heater typically does. What if we think differently, realizing that during the day most folks are at work, we get up, we shower, we go to work, we come home, might have hot water needs for cooking, for doing dishes, taking baths for the kids, et cetera. But what happens if we begin to control that device a little bit differently than we do today? Ooh, this is a sensitive clicker. There we go. Completely different profile in terms of when I need to provide power to that particular device. We are talking about a communication device where you can shut off that water heater during the times when it's not being used, but most importantly, when you are going to need that, then you increase the amount of preheating. It's thermal storage. No different than battery storage. It is another storage mechanism, but it's thermal storage, and it's using hot water as the medium. It's a great opportunity to take advantage of the fact that we have 50 million homes, 
50 million water heaters. If those were electric water heaters that would afford increased flexibility, we're talking about about 150 gigawatt hours, potentially, of load flexibility. That's significant. Remember I talked about 200 today, going up to 300 in the next five years? This is really important when you are valuing your wind and solar and you are looking for load that can potentially take that power when it's being generated. Very important for the utilities to understand how they can use this in managing their system. Another example of that is the Nest thermostat. I know Lincoln Electric is part of the, uh, the Rush program for, uh, for Nest. And uh, when you look at this, I want to make a couple comments. One around artificial intelligence, but two around what this enables, the smart thermostats. The intent here is that you are not actively engaged with your thermostat. I don't think most of us really care in terms of I'm going to go turn down my thermostat a couple degrees or turn it up a couple degrees and save X amount of power. The reality is what they are projecting is that from a consumer behavior perspective, you don't care. But if you give me access to your, let's say, heat pump, and the average heat pump is 3KW in the United States, or has a 3KW demand, you give me access to that heat pump, and 500,000 of you give me access to your heat pumps, and I get to control that when I want, and you are only concerned about comfort in your home, make sure that my home is comfortable to the specification that I want, then you don't care if I increase that or decrease that at different times of the day as long as it doesn't impact my comfort. Now, some people would say, no, I do care about that, but by and large, the, the notion is that Google and Nest is betting on is that you won't care. So if I have a 3KW heat pump and there's 500,000 of you that have this, uh, this um, uh, particular um, device in your home and the heat pump, then I can technically curtail your power and that's equivalent to a 1500 megawatt power plant. That could be a nuclear power plant, that could be a coal plant, that could be a whole variety of different technologies. That's the power of these distributed flexible loads and the importance of being able to recognize what their importance is. Let me just make a comment about, about Google and the artificial intelligence. Google isn't selling a little piece of technology here. And I think most of you know Google owns Nest. What Google's most interested in is understanding the behaviors that are going on inside your home. Years ago when I was at the utility industry, PG&E in California is where I started my career, we used to talk about the customer, and I, I find it really interesting today because the utility industry is so interested in customers, you know, so interested in making sure that they establish loyalty with customers today. PG&E back in those days, they referred to the customers as two things, either load or ratepayers. The term customer never came up, and I left PG&E in about 1995. So in that whole thing as a utility, they had a captive audience. They never really worried about how do I need to manage and maintain and establish loyalty with these customers. And they would always say the benefit that we have is we have the access point to the home. No one else can get in the home. So we'll be able to maintain that, those customers going forward. Well, guess what? Wireless allowed everyone to leapfrog the meter and everybody's inside the home and that's where the Internet of Things, you have Alexa and all these devices. All of them are intended to begin to understand your behaviors. And by understanding your behaviors, then how do I monetize those behaviors to manage to your respective requirements? Ultimately, the home of the future, you may not even own your refrigerator. If the refrigeration load is important, why don't we own the refrigeration load? We get to manage it. We just need to make sure that we keep your food at a certain temperature so that you're happy. But the rest of the energy consumption in that refrigerator, we get to manage. That's one device. Do that across millions. All of a sudden, you have a virtual power plant. That's where the power of this flexibility and flexible load comes into play. And I really want to emphasize it to the group, because many people think about this as being something way off in the future. I can tell you that in the same vein that we're going to talk about automation for cars, we are looking really in the next five years for significant changes around Internet of Things and flexible loads inside of homes. Significant. And I mentioned already going from 200 gigawatts up to 300 in the next five years. That's built upon those 30 million connected device, devices today, jumping up to about 60 million in the next five years. So significant changes going on in your home, whether or not you want to accept it or not, you don't have to. But many folks really don't care about their electric usage unless two things. 
Power goes out, now I'm concerned about it, or cost goes up, and now I'm concerned about it. Time and time again, folks talk about those two things in terms of that's all that's important to them. So Google seizes us an opportunity to monetize something that we really don't care about. So taking that a step forward, whoops, let's go to the last one, 21%. Any ideas what 21% represents in terms of adoption of electrification end uses? 21% is actually the amount of electricity used today at end use. So what's that tell me? 21%, that means 79% is provided by other fuels. So go back to this concept of economy-wide. We can't just think about kilowatt hours and therms anymore. So we tend to be pretty myopic in the way that we looked at the electricity sector. It was just what we were producing and what was being consumed. But economy-wide, if you look at the total energy used by all appliances, vehicles, all end uses, electricity is only 21% of that. Tell me, for me, I get pretty excited thinking about that. 21%, that means there's 79% market opportunity out there that we need to take advantage of. And going back, if we are greening the supply and we're developing a much more dynamic and flexible grid to help manage load and supply together, then wouldn't we want to begin to drive adoption of electrification and uses going forward? Wouldn't that be the natural, if you want to benefit your consumers in terms of affordability, if you want to benefit society in terms of our environmental footprint, and ultimately from a utility perspective, if you want, or even a developer perspective, if you want to make your economics look better by improving asset utilization. Goes for a utility, goes for wind and solar developers. That's the win-win-win that we're talking about here. So 21% of end use today is electrification, 79% market potential. And I'm going to go back to think about efficient electrification again. So real quickly, let's talk about a few things in terms of efficiency, and I think this is important to point out. I mentioned that our industries invest about $8 billion on an annual basis in terms of energy efficiency programs. Change out a light bulb, some of the process improvements that we do, all built around things that we get to control from an electricity or from a natural gas perspective. But what's really driving efficiency today is something different. Um, once again, looking up here, you see Apple. How many of you, by the way, know that Apple is now a power marketer? Yeah, a couple of you do. I mean, that's, to me, that's fascinating. Apple, maker of that phone, is a power marketer, a power marketer in the energy industry. Think about that for a moment. Google invests more in energy-related R&D than all of the utilities invest in EPRI. I don't mean that as a, a call. Like I said, EPRI is a very healthy company. But what I'm showing you is the level of deep pockets that these companies have and their interest in our market. Give you an idea, Google went public in 2004. In 2014, Google's market cap was about, I think, $600 billion. That's probably close to a trillion today. But $600 billion in 2014, it would take the top 20 IOUs in the United States to equal one Google. So when you look at the deep pockets that these companies have, and they don't have the regulatory framework by and large, very interested in this market, but really their, their notion around energy efficiency was completely different. What they said is, hey, these phones, we need to pack as much as possible in there. We need to have a battery that lasts as long as possible. So how do we make this as efficient as possible? And that really began to generate uh, the concept around the LED light bulb. Today, around LED light bulbs, and I'm sure most of you had, LED lighting has reduced lighting load by 75%. It's absolutely phenomenal when you think. This is probably, from an inflection, this is probably one of the most um, uh, game-changer, disruptive technologies that has ever hit our industry. You think about that, 75% in lighting. And you know the other thing? It's highly controllable. And by highly controllable, I can control spectrums of LED, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit and some of the things that it enables. But you look at what it affords the industry, just this one technology, and what's going on in smart cities now where you have LED lighting that can adjust the level of lighting based upon how many people are in the area, or instead of having street lights on all day or all night long, someone walks by, it picks up from a motion sensor, and then depending upon how long they stay in that area, it can either increase the brightness or it can decrease it. It's amazing to think about the level of control that's going on. And this isn't, once again, futuristic. This is happening right now. But just to translate that for you, 
Take a look just at the bottom of what's happened in terms of the TVs that all of us have had in our homes, or have in our homes. Uh, at times, I want to throw mine out when Penn State football isn't going well, but uh, yeah. bottom line, TVs have become incredibly efficient. One of the common devices that we have in our home, driven by what was going on up there with the iPhone. And the last point I want to make just about energy, whoops, about energy efficiency is in 2008, we saw a change in terms of a decoupling around gross domestic product growth and electricity consumption. By and large, they used to track evenly. Gross domestic product was growing, electricity consumption was growing kind of in, in parallel path with it. That changed in 2008. Now, a lot of things happened in our economy also. Obviously, it became more of a service economy, had less manufacturing than we did in the past, but it also gets back to energy efficiency going forward. So I'm going to argue that that's actually a positive thing and something that we're going to highlight as a benefit of electrification going forward because, once again, electrification is a more efficient end-use fuel than its fossil fuel counterparts. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but just keep that in mind in terms of uh, how gross domestic, domestic product and electrification have changed in terms of the relationship. Now, I want to talk about transportation, and I, I know I'm in Nebraska, and, and I, one of the things of working at EPRI, it's wonderful that we have incredible researchers. Uh, we have a staff of about 800 folks, 600 of those are researchers, and many world-class in their respective areas. We have someone who does our modeling around transportation, and uh, I'll tell you, if you have any questions in terms of profiles of communities, trying to understand what might be different about Nebraska versus, say, California in terms of adoption of EVs, he can give you all of that data. So I went to him as I was preparing for this talk, and I said, so Jeff, tell me what's different about Nebraska. You know, everyone says EVs in Nebraska aren't going to work because it's a rural community. And he came back and he said, well, actually, Rob, when I look at the profile of uh, Nebraska in terms of the type of vehicles in Nebraska, cars versus trucks, it's very similar to the average U.S. profile. Not that much different. I said, okay, so the profile of vehicles is pretty much the same, and there's a few variations there, but it's not that much different. I said, tell me about electric vehicles in, in rural America. And he said, well, Rob, think about it. Most of the folks in Nebraska live in population centers. Two-thirds of the folks live in Omaha, Lincoln, some of the bigger cities. And yes, then there's a third of folks that are in the rural area where maybe adoption of electric vehicles is going to be less, in, or they're going to be less inclined to adopt electric vehicles. But really, the profile of Nebraska isn't that much different than average U.S. I found that interesting. So I wanted to share with you what we see trends going around in terms of electric vehicles. And there's six primary trends that, uh, that I want to highlight to you. And you may say, hey, I don't see this happening here. I'm just going to say this is what you see happening across the United States. Or to start with the first trend, more importantly, what's going on internationally. So the first international trend that I want to highlight to you, it's all around policy. Now, we don't have a lot of policy in the U.S. in terms of adoption of electric vehicles. We're starting to see some come into play. We do have some incentives, and in essence, folks could say that's policy. It's intended to influence behaviors. Um, but the reality is, when you look at what's going on in Europe, where they are actually restricting and eliminating many of their fossil fuel vehicles, production of them by 2025, 2030, that's going to have a significant impact in terms of electric vehicle. Shell Oil over in Europe is now developing electric charging stations. Shell Oil is developing electric charging stations in the UK. That says an oil company that's beginning to look and say things are changing, I need to be out in front of this change and make sure that we're prepared. But when you have a policy that will restrict the adoption, or excuse me, the manufacturing of internal combustion engines going forward, that's going to have a significant impact in terms of electric vehicle adoption. And once that starts happening over there, it's going to start happening over here. Second policy that I really want to highlight for you comes into what we call the, uh, the autonomous uh, uh, vehicle. And one of the most important things at our electrification conference that I mentioned uh, that we had in Long Beach in August, we had GM come and speak at that conference. And when you look at U.S. auto manufacturers, they're all very focused on what do our consumers want? And you know what? By and large, 66% of consumers, they want either an SUV or they want a truck. Even in California, 
my son wants a truck and he tells me it's to remodel his home. He's never put a darn thing in that, that bed of that truck and yet he wants a truck. And that's what the consumer preference is. So one of the challenges right now from a GM perspective, from a Ford, from the big automakers, how do we make sure that we have vehicles that consumers want? Because it's one thing to talk about technical potential and say, hey, look at all this fossil engine or uh, internal combustion engine vehicles out there. If we have them convert to electric vehicles, What's that technical potential? And then we can talk about economic potential. So economic potential says price parity. Are we at price parity? Can I buy an electric vehicle today and have it be the same cost as my internal combustion engine? 2018, answer no. 2021, answer yes. 2021, we will be at price parity if you look at a total cost of ownership. Okay, and this is where we need to change the dialogue that's going on in the industry right now. If we look at a total cost of ownership, you and I go to the auto dealer, I look at the, the sticker price and make a decision about that. If a sticker price said, hey, you're gonna buy this vehicle for $50,000 and it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars to operate it over the next 11 years, which is a typical period that we own a car, and then compares that to an electric vehicle sticker price in the total cost of ownership, you're gonna see price parity in 2021. If we change that dialogue, create consumer awareness, consumers are gonna be much more apt to identify the understanding, with the understanding that electric vehicles are more energy efficient and ultimately cheaper to operate. Maintenance is cheaper, fuel will be cheaper, electricity is cheaper, all ties back to that energy efficiency. But the other component that's tying in here then is the achievable potential, and it goes back to what I said. If 66% of you want an SUV or us on the same way, want an SUV or a truck, if that's not available, then I'm gonna go ahead and buy something else, an internal combustion engine, and guess what, by the end of the day, that internal combustion engine I keep for about 11 years. So I am missing an entire cycle. That's why you are seeing such a push right now that's going on in terms of the, uh, the auto manufacturers to bring electric vehicles to market. We have about 35 electric vehicle model types right now, 2018, 2020, they expect more than 100. And that will include some of the first trucks out there. So they are listening to their consumers, they're responding very quickly in terms of this transition. But I started this by talking about GM, talking at our conference. One of the things that GM said at our conference is, you know what, we are so focused on autonomous vehicles, we expect a level four autonomous vehicle in San Francisco in 2019. Now let me tell you what a level four, most of us in our cars have cruise control, that's kind of a level one in terms of autonomous vehicles. Level three basically says that you have all the lane changing and safety features that are in, in the car, you still need the driver in terms of being able to, to, uh, to be able to manage. Level four says the car is capable of driving itself. It might be limited to a specific area where they've done all the mapping, um, but it is capable of driving itself. So imagine what that affords from a societal perspective. I'm elderly, not able to drive anymore. I can summon an Uber, a driverless Uber, come to my door, pick me up, and take me to my appointments. It affords a whole nother opportunity that society really hasn't been able to take advantage of because the cost, right now the cost of an Uber is too expensive for that. Believe it or not, an Uber is what, about half the cost of a taxi cab. But the value that they see right now is if you can make that vehicle electric, my overall cost of operation is lower, and if you can make it autonomous, I get the driver out of the vehicle, I can now have a price point that is very economic. And that's the whole point around autonomous vehicles. It's why electric transportation is going to be the enabling technology to support autonomous vehicles going forward. That's 2019. Now, California law stipulates that you will still have to have a driver in that at level four car until the point that they get comfortable with the technology, which could be years down the road. But it is the beginning of a trend that autonomous vehicles, and when we did our modeling, we looked at what's gonna happen in terms of driver trends. We expect the number of vehicle miles traveled to go up significantly because this whole portion of our society, even young kids, parents can't get home to take Johnny to soccer practice. Johnny could call a vehicle himself or his parents could take him to soccer practice. Or for our elderly parents who can't get out and about, 
all of a sudden they'll have that opportunity. So we expect a significant change going on in terms of the transportation side in its near term. Let me point out one other thing for you just on this slide. Um, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me in China, and I use China just to say once again, it's not because I'm, a, I'm so impressed with what they're doing and the most important the impact that's going to have on us over in the U.S. In China, from a bus perspective, 9,500 electric buses are put on the road every five weeks in China. 9,500 electric buses, that's the equivalent of the entire London bus fleet. Every five weeks. Now, LA and California has agreed to electrify its entire fleet of city and county buses. And they're gonna do it before 2028, because what's 2028? The Olympics in LA. And what are they concerned about in LA with the same thing China's concerned about? Smog. It's not carbon, it's smog. So what's driving uh, the, the decision in LA is all around, we need to clean up the smog and buses contribute a significantly more amount of smog than a, uh, a car does. So they're focused from a air quality perspective going to electrify the, the bus fleet in uh, LA by 2026, but in China, 9,500 new electric buses every five weeks. So the reason I bring that up, what's that do from a price point perspective? It's continuing to drop that down significantly. So once again, we have this incredible opportunity to build upon what's going on in China and to leverage that. Think about when a bus fleet operates. I mean, pretty much short runs, back and forth. You're not worried about range anxiety or anything else. It's a great opportunity. I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a couple weeks ago to present at TVA, and guess what they had in downtown Chattanooga? an entire electric bus fleet. I couldn't believe it because I didn't think Chattanooga figured, fit the profile of a city that was willing to adopt emerging technologies, but here they had an entire electric bus fleet in downtown Chattanooga. So I'm just pointing that out, that cities are beginning to adopt these trends. Last trend I just want to point out to you is what's going on in terms of lithium ion batteries, and it ties back to the electric buses, it ties back to what's going on at Tesla. Tesla has very aggressive predictions in terms of where that electric battery cost is going to go, the lithium ion battery pack, and they think it's going to drop fairly dramatically. Every time, if you look at uh, the last, uh, actually I have it on the next slide, Oop. boy. I don't have it on that slide, but uh, if you look at what's happened in terms of uh, the, the cost of lithium ion batteries, it dropped by about 50% uh, uh, over the past six years. That reduces the cost of an electric vehicle by $7,000. Just that drop in price associated with the lithium ion battery pack. Tesla's right that that's going to continue to drop by 2021, 2022. They will definitely have their $30,000, $35,000 electric vehicle on the road. So right now, the Tesla Model 3 is not a $35,000 vehicle, by the way. It's more about a $60,000 vehicle because they're only doing the extended range one with other options on it. So really, to get down to the price point where the average consumer can consider buying that vehicle it needs to be in the $30,000 to $35,000 range. But that gives you an idea of transportation, and I just want to bring this back to Nebraska a little bit to say that these trends aren't only for on-road. They're actually for industrial applications, for farming, and for other uh, activities that are going on. John Deere tractor up in the left-hand corner. John Deere tractor looking at a fully electric autonomous tractor that is in prototype right now and actually being demonstrated. Now, you know more about what it means to get the farmer out of the tractor and what an electric tractor might mean for farm operations, but their premise is, once again, it goes back to economics. We're going to give you a technology option that's going to ultimately be cheaper for you to operate, and then if you come from a, a manpower perspective, remove the driver of that tractor, what's the value of that going to be from a farming perspective? Very significant. That's not something that's 10 years away. That's something that they are prototyping right now. If you go to John Deere, it's right there on their website, and you can read all about it. And so very important. The other things I want to highlight to you when you look at any of your manufacturing facilities, your food processing, forklifts, forklifts, electric forklifts are a primary easy conversion over from propane or natural gas into electric. It has a couple other benefits just beside the energy efficiency from a safety perspective. Do you want to be in a closed-in warehouse breathing propane or natural gas fumes? No. 
electric doesn't have the fume. So from a health and safety perspective, they also look at the electric forklifts as being very, very important. And Amazon, of course, all the warehouses that they have are investing heavily in the electric forklifts. A few other ones that you can look there in terms of automate or electrification of airline, uh, airports, et cetera, very important. Uh, obviously, Nebraska, I'm going to mention a port not relevant to you, but Nebraska, or, but the port electrification is really important for the U.S. This gets back in terms of uh, Savannah, Georgia, one of the first port electrifications in the United States. But the union especially was concerned about all of the diesel trucks and ships and everything else idling and creating health issues. Elimination of that has improved the, the health of the, uh, the environment right around the port and it's reduced costs significantly. So just making the, the point, once again, there's a variety of technologies on road from a transportation perspective, off road from a transportation perspective, where electrification is not only economic, but it, uh, it uh, um, helps improve overall energy efficiency and helps support uh, safety going forward. And I'm gonna jump, this is really, I must have heavy fingers and that's pushing right along. I did wanna mention this just for the farm community here. This is something that uh, I mentioned earlier about LED lights in a new industry that they, in essence, because of their controllability, they've been able to enable uh, indoor farming. And I was cautious about this when I talked to Dairyland um, uh, several months ago and thought, do I really wanna talk about indoor farming, would folks be, feel that that's a threat ultimately to their livelihood? And actually I had the exact opposite reaction where folks were very interested. And in how do we look at this as an opportunity to expand our own operations? But uh, the average head of lettuce that travels, uh, grown in California, travels to Chicago, goes 3,000 miles, typically in a diesel truck. And okay? that diesel truck is, you know, consuming quite a bit of energy and putting out quite a bit environmental impacts in terms of air quality and CO2. If we can eliminate that transportation from the growing center to where the urban center is where that head of lettuce is gonna be used, what are the benefits of that? And that's where indoor farming comes into play, where you're actually being able to emulate sunlight through LED lights all day long. The number of crop cycles that you can have is significant. You don't have to worry about snow coming in. You don't have to worry about excess temperature. It's all a controlled environment that you're operating in. You're using about 85% less water. You're using about 95% less fertilizer. Crop yield, like I said, is significantly higher. And all of this is being enabled by technologies that are doing one thing. They're efficient but they're driving up the use of electricity. Now in our utility world, driving up the use of electricity is frowned upon. It's not okay to grow load. We're all about energy efficiency. But when I look at from an economy-wide perspective and look at energy efficiency, this is an opportunity for us to really take advantage of this technology and other technologies as long as we think about it from an economy-wide perspective. Someone who wants to tell me that this isn't efficient is absolutely wrong. It's very efficient for the reasons I just cited. The fact that it increases kilowatt hour load isn't a bad thing. And as an industry, we need to move away from thinking if we grow our load, that's a bad thing. We need to move our regulators away from that. We need to move our shareholders, our stakeholders, we need to move our consumers away from that. I want to be able to really highlight just one thing on this chart here, because it really summarizes everything that we've talked about. First of all, along the bottom, it talks about where the potential is from a technical potential, economic, and then ultimately achievable. This slide summarizes the U.S. National Electrification Assessment that EPRA conducted on behalf of its member utilities. But when you look at this, I want to go up to the right-hand corner. So you see electricity, electricity load. This is what we call a reference scenario. In reference scenario, let me make this point. In our reference scenario, we assume the economic adoption of end-use electrification technologies. Economic adoption only. That means price parity has been achieved. There's no policy built in here. So if a carbon policy comes along at some point, this all changes and we have those cases analyzed in our, our uh, uh, assessment also. But you see electricity growth, pretty significant growth by about 32%. Not bad for an industry that's been flat or declining over the past 10, 15 years. 
But I also want to point out natural gas. Natural gas grows cons um, considerably also, which is really important. One of the things around natural gas, they get very concerned when we were doing this study, saying, wait, we see this trade-off going on. You're going to choose electrification over natural gas end uses. Well, the reality is what happens, natural gas is playing a key role in terms of greening the power supply. We talked about that. But it's also, if you look at buildings and industry, it's going to continue to play a key role in buildings and industry. You are not going to make an economic decision to go to electricity unless it benefits you. So that's the, the premise of the report that we have here. But if you go over to the far right side, highlight energy efficiency, significant improvement in overall economy-wide energy efficiency. We are growing the electric load, but we are improving overall economy-wide energy efficiency. That folks, is very important for everyone to grab a hold of and to think about it is okay to grow a kilowatt hour or to increase the thermal gas as long as economy-wide energy efficiency is still being maintained, and that's what we show here. Second thing is carbon. I mentioned at the beginning, carbon could be a big driver for us going forward. In some jurisdictions it is, California, New York. Carbon is huge in terms of the role that it's playing right now. Um, so how do we manage a industry where we are reducing the carbon footprint. One is to green the supply, but then ultimately adopting end-use electrification technologies that have a lower carbon footprint than their fossil alternatives is a second way to do that. And let's take advantage of that green fuel. But the last point I want to make to you up here is what we call share of wallet. So share of wallet, you're a consumer out there, you're worried about one thing, affordability. And reliability goes with that from an electricity sect, uh, perspective, but you're worried about your, your overall energy budget. None of us think about energy budget. I don't think about how much I pay for gas and then add in my electric bill and then add in my natural gas bill and come up with a total energy budget. We call it share of wallet. I think about what I pay for my electric bill. So my electric bill goes up at home. I say, what's going on? You know, are we using more? Is that utility charging us again? And but in reality, it's okay if my electric bill goes up as long as my share of wallet in terms of total energy is going down. And what we are showing here, because electricity end use is more efficient, more economic, and the total cost of operation will be lower, there's an economic advantage to adopting electrification end use technologies. Your share of energy wallet is going to go down what you invest in, in overall energy. That's a key point. So if I'm a consumer, you have just told me you are making my life more affordable while I'm adopting more efficient electrification technologies that are reducing our carbon footprint, improving air quality, ultimately supporting safety and perhaps water reduction, et cetera. A whole host of benefits that you're going to see. So to close this, what I always like to do is to summarize the key points. I started off at the beginning and I said, I'm going to show you why I believe efficient electrification is a win for society, a win for our consumers, and ultimately a win for the asset owners in our industry. And this slide right here really does a nice job of characterizing it. It shows that from 1987 to 2015, that was the last time that we doubled in terms of GDP growth, 87 to 2015. And by and large, you can see how energy tracked and you can see what was going on in carbon. Pretty linear in terms of the overall projection. But now when you take a look at what we are projecting to happen from 2015 to 2015 or 50, and once again, this is economic adoption only, we will double the economy. That's from the energy um, um, EIA where they have come up with this projection. But we're going to be able to reduce significantly our carbon footprint, not only because supply is greening, but because of adoption of end use technologies. And we're going to be able to significantly reduce the amount of energy consumption within this company, uh, country. So society benefits, air quality is improved, carbon's reduced, water improvements, safety, consumers, affordability, sustainability, flexibility, three important terms to them, affordability being one of the top ones, and then from an asset owner's perspective. The more you can spread your cost over a greater asset utilization, whether you're a utility, whether you're a wind or solar developer, 
the more beneficial you're going to be in terms of being able to manage the economics of that project. And ultimately, that turns right back around in terms of supporting affordability for your consumers, which is one of your key drivers. So with that, let me conclude my remarks, Jason, and uh, open it up to any questions you might have. Yes, certainly. Thank you. We did get a few submitted uh, via the website, so appreciate that. And I don't know if there are any out there uh, being collected on the cards, but I'll start with summarizing some of the ones that came in via the app. Uh, what is the future of battery disposal and component reclamation? Got a great question. Um, and I should have mentioned that when I was talking about it. It's one of the areas that this industry has to, uh, to tackle right now. Uh, and that has to do with either the, uh, the recycling or disposal of not only batteries, but solar panels and uh, wind turbines. So to give you an idea of stat, I just saw, we're gonna have about 225,000 225,000 tons of wind turbines disposed, ready to be disposed in the next 20 years. We're gonna have about 35 million solar panels ready to, to be disposed in about 20 years. We need to begin to think about what we are going to do with these particular products in advance of that issue coming up. We don't want disposal of whether it be wind turbines, solar panels, or even batteries to be an issue in terms of uh, environmental impacts. We also need just environmental impacts. We need to take a look, of course, at the avian interactions that go on with wind turbines. One of the things that we're very focused on is being able to, to manage that so it can maximize your output from the turbine while also minimizing uh, any of the avian interactions. But in terms of battery disposal, one of the things that we have the opportunity as an industry to do, you take it from a car, it's not quite good enough to stay in the car after about seven, eight years, but put it into the grid, utility grid system. So we can continue to take advantage of that particular battery for about another 10, 15 years. Have we figured out what we're gonna do from a disposal perspective? No, and that is actually, in all honesty, one of the key areas of EPRI research that we're focused on right now. How do we begin to address the next equivalent of the coal ash issue for the electricity sector around renewables and around battery storage? So great question. Okay, somewhat related to that, what are the potential up and coming battery technologies? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, we read all the time that there's a whole host of technologies that are out there, battery technologies that are, are ready to come to market and they're going to be much more um, effective in terms of, uh, of storage um, per, per volume uh, than the current lithium ion. I want to make a point here. First of all, lithium ion, when you look at the production facilities that are out there with the lithium ion, I don't see lithium ion going by the wayside anytime soon. We're going to continue to see production improvements. We're going to continue to see energy output improvements from lithium ion. It doesn't mean that some of the solid state batteries and other technologies that are out there aren't going to slowly evolve. But for the near future, I wouldn't expect from an economic perspective that there's going to be any significant competitors to the lithium ion battery technology that's out there right now. Just my perspective, others might have a completely different perspective, but I always go back to economics. At the end of the day, it has to be viable from an economic perspective. And in order to do that right now, lithium ion has such a jump on the industry with what they're able to do that I just don't see it transitioning um, in the near future. Okay, next question. Uh, although you mentioned that fossil fuel generation has declined, are there any projections that, so, that show electric generation from fossil fuels will return to be the largest CO2 emitter? Yeah, actually not a projection that's going to be the largest CO2 emitter. So I, I will tell you, this is um, it's a really important discussion that our industry has to have. Renewables can't do it alone. You know, and any time I hear anyone say that, hey, we're going to be 100% renewables and, uh, and life is going to be wonderful, it, it, completely ignores the reality of how to operate a, uh, a power system. So from an EPRI perspective, our research shows that all technologies, and from a central generation down to renewables, down to distributed energy, are all very important going forward. That includes nuclear, and includes natural gas, and it includes potentially coal with carbon capture and sequestration. And let me mention carbon capture and sequestration because it's not only about the coal, but natural gas has a 50% footprint of coal in terms of car uh, carbon. And in the end, if there is a carbon tax, and this gets back to economics, if there's some sort of carbon policy that our country adopts, that's going to impact natural gas also. If natural gas is going to stay in that mix and be economic, then we have to think about carbon capture and sequestration. So EPRI modeling, we do believe that capture and sequestration 
is a technology that needs to continue to be developed. And so that fossil fuels will remain part of the supply mix going forward because they provide that base load that we need in order to support our grid. But at some point without capture and storage technology, then fossil is gonna have a very challenging time staying in the mix if a carbon policy is adopted. Okay, this too is also related, but uh, do you think wind and solar will be able to replace fossil, fossil fuels for peak and off-peak load serving? Yeah, kind of interesting. So I'm going to go back to taking advantage of all flexible loads. So one of the things, I'm in California, and this is kind of a, uh, interesting how California has yet to show the slow evolution of the regulatory uh, environment. If I buy an electric vehicle in California, when do they want me to charge that vehicle? They want me to charge that vehicle during the day because we have an incredible amount of solar. We have so much solar that we're shipping it to Arizona for free. Arizona is thinking about taking their school buses, taking the free solar from California, and charging those school buses in the summertime when they're not being utilized so that they have stationary storage, battery storage. But that's all premised on California shipping this free solar to Arizona. So what does California need to do? And I'll get back to the, the question. California needs to think about how do we drive behaviors First of all, promote adoption of electric vehicles, but then second, how do we drive behaviors that says charge that during the day while you're at work? I drive into work, I plug in, and that's an opportunity for me to take advantage of the renewable load that's being generated at that point in time. It goes back to managing the flexibility of the load that we have with the intermittency of the supply that we have. So we have this opportunity to do this, whether or not, now contrast that, Nebraska, with your wind, when do I want to drive charging of electric technology or vehicles at night. Minnesota, same thing. Where the wind's blowing at night, that's where I want people to come home and I want them to plug their vehicles in when the wind starts blowing and that renewable energy is available. So it's a variety of things that will be required in terms of managing peak loads. Renewables aren't gonna be able to do it all, but with flexibility, with battery storage, with a variety of other technologies to make sure that the intermittency day by day is being uh, addressed, Renewables ultimately will play a big role in the, the, the picture going forward. Okay, so this one is also very closely related to what you just said, but do you see uh, groundwater irrigation as a possible way to use uh, renewable generation when it's online and available and varying that groundwater irrigation as a load to match renewable generation? Yeah, great question. I haven't looked at it in detail, and it's something I, I do want to um, go back and take a look at, but. Whoever asked that question is thinking about it the right way. What other loads, you probably have heard of uh, power to gas. If we have all this renewable energy and we don't have load at that point, why don't we make hydrogen? Why don't we create a gas that ultimately can then be transported and used when it's needed? And so there's all these concepts of what loads out there potentially could be developed in order to support the renewable resources that we have when they are producing the power. So I haven't looked at irrigation water specifically, but it's a, it's a concept that's I'd like to, to look a little deeper at. Okay, so we have far more questions than we have uh, time here left <laughs> in, our, in our allotted time frame, but I do want to try to get one more in. Uh, and thank you to everybody that submitted questions and for using the, the, the electronic tools to submit it. Um, what level of certainty would you attribute to electric vehicle customer adoption modeling? Yeah, um, another great question. So <clears throat> our model is all built around economic adoption. Um, and uh, in California, there's policy also that drives those economics. So for instance, when uh, you have federal and state incentives, that helps support adoption of that. Not all states have state incentives. Uh, you have utility incentives. For instance, Southern California Edison, in addition to the federal credit and the state credit from California, just announced a $3,000 per vehicle uh, incentive to support adoption of the Nissan LEAF in California. So we looked at only economic adoption. We didn't look at incentives that were potentially being put in play by utilities and others. So I would say that we have a relatively conservative, and I mentioned 60% of the vehicle miles traveled by 2050, we believe will be electric vehicles. 
I believe that we have a relatively conservative approach because it doesn't look at what utilities might do, what states might do to increase uh, adoption, influence consumer behaviors that will lead to increased adoption of electric vehicles. So great question, but I think we're relatively conservative, all based upon economics and what we project out the cost to be. And what we say, hey, if that cost is there, in the vehicle is available in terms of uh, a truck or an SUV, you will adopt it. That's the premise that we operate from. Okay, very good. Well, that takes us essentially to the end of our time. Thank you again, everyone, for submitting questions. And please, let's give Mr. Chapman a round of applause for joining us today.